Um, okay, so my name is Kai Hua Qin. I'm a PhD student from Imperial College London. Um, I'm happy here to, to present our work on flash loans. Uh, this is a joint work with Li Zhou, who is popular in the audience, and uh, Benjamin Lifshitz, and my supervisor, Arthur Jive. Uh, so I, I would uh, start with a very simple introduction example. So we have here a junior guy, let's call him Bob, and a senior guy called Bart. So Bob has a passion for music. He wants to purchase this um, uh, turntable to, to maybe compose some music. Uh, the problem is that he doesn't have enough money to buy this turntable, uh, which is brand new and fancy. Um, so what he could do is to um, uh, ask for credit from Bart, and he can um, basically buy the turntable now and uh, pay the money later. So what, what would possibly go wrong? Um, well, uh, Bob could, could go bankrupt, right? So by not being able to repay the debt. Um, now this brings us to the interesting question. So is that possible that Bob can grant a law to Bob without the risk of Bob, uh, Bob defaulting on debt? By defaulting, I mean somebody is not able to pay back a loan plus the interest, which may accumulate over time. Uh, this sounds quite impossible in our traditional economics because no matter how small or how short in time the law is, there is always a risk that a borrower might default. But in this DeFi world, uh, in this uh, smart contract-based blockchain system, it is feasible. The borrower can basically take the so-called flash loans and the lender is guaranteed that the money will be repaid by the borrower. So if you, you look at um, uh, from a more technical side, we, we have a pool that is essentially some smart contracts, uh, which collects liquidity from lenders. The borrower then takes the flash loan from the lending pool, um, do whatever he wants with the capital and repay within the same transaction. Now the question is, why is this possible and how is the payment a repayment guaranteed? Uh, I'd like to first introduce one of the unique properties of blockchain transactions that is automaticity. We, we know that a blockchain transaction can be uh, more complicated than a single money transfer. Smart contracts allows you to um, bundle several actions into one transaction. Uh, here, an action can be a, a simple money transfer or ether transfer or more complicated stuff like calling into another smart contract. Uh, like here, we have a transaction TX with action one, two, three uh, bundled together. Now when executing TX, uh, what would happen if action one and two succeed, but action three fails? Mm, Ethereum gives you the option to revert, which means you can revert the whole transaction on the specific condition. Uh, here we can program to revert the TX if action three can, cannot be executed. So the blockchain state will go back to the point before executing TX, even action one and two can be executed successfully. And this is how a flash loan can work. Uh, in a flash loan, the borrower first borrow from the lending pool, then it can do anything with the funds, but um, in the end of the transaction, the borrower should repay the loan. Uh, otherwise, the transaction will be reverted. You can think in a way that if you cannot repay, then the borrowing never happened, which I'm not aware of uh, any way can, uh, can do that uh, in the traditional finance. Uh, I will also quickly go over some other types of uh, DeFi services uh, or platforms that are relevant in my talk. So the first one is uh, automated market maker exchange. Uh, AMM is essentially a liquidity pool that uh, contains assets supplied by the so-called liquidity providers. In an AMM, instead of uh, matching orders among buyers and sellers, liquidity takers trade against the pool at the price determined by mathematical formulas. One of the most popular AMM formula is the constant product rule. In a constant product AMM, there is a pair of tokens. Um, the rule is actually quite simple. So 
no matter what direction you trade, the product of the supplies of the tokens keeps unchanged. Here I put, provide a very simple toy example, which I assume that there is a constant product pool supplied with two Bitcoins and five Ether initially. Um, apparently uh, the product of the supplies initially is 10. Now I'd like to trade my five Ether for some Bitcoins. What I'm gonna do is I just send my five Ether to, to the pool so that the pool now contains 10 Ether, right? So to make sure the product is still 10, the pool should uh, have now one Bitcoin. So which means I can get the other one Bitcoin. So similarly in the second trade, I can trade my 10 Ether and receive half, uh, half a Bitcoin. So here, the interesting stuff is that I provide more ether, but I receive less Bitcoin in the second tra trade. This is the so-called slippage, which means that um, the more you buy, the worse the price is. So the next one is over collateralized lending. Uh, in such a lending system, a borrower needs to de deposit asset Y as a collateral and a borrow asset X. Uh, over collateralization means that uh, requires that um, the value of the collateral is larger than the value of the debt. Otherwise, other DeFi participants called liquidators are allowed to repay the debt of the, of the borrower. And in return, the liquidator can profit by purchasing the borrower's collateral at a discounted price. We call this process liquidation. So far, over collateralization lending is um, one of the most uh, significant DeFi use cases. Um, I'd like to emphasize that uh, to, to measure the value of different tokens, most lending platforms rely on price oracles, which are essentially smart contracts that uh, store the price of the asset and are updated periodically. Some lending platforms use AMM, I just mentioned, as their price oracles, which is sometimes not secure. We'll see that in a bit. So to my knowledge, uh, the, the concept of uh, flash loans was first introduced by the Marble Protocol. While um, Ava is one of the first DeFi platforms that widely advertise uh, flash loan capabilities. Uh, to understand how flash loans are used, we collected all the Ava flash loan events from January to September in the year of 2020. Uh, we detected in total more than 5,000 flash loan events accumulated to more than 400 million US dollars in value. We also noticed that the most popular flash loan tokens are DAI, USDC, that are stable coins, and Ether, which is the native cryptocurrency of Ethereum. We inspect the use cases of flash loans by checking the invoked smart contracts in the flash loan transactions. We find that upcharge and the liquidation um, are the dominating use cases. Um, some attackers also use flash loans to manipulate the price oracles and also um, like pump and dump uh, token prices, which we will discuss later. Um, you can also use it to, uh, to do wash trading. Uh, for example, you can uh, borrow a large amount of your favorite asset, swap uh, them to Ether, for example, and immediately trade back and then repay the flash loan within one transaction. So actually you didn't do any effective trades, but uh, the trading volume is actually increased twice. So this is how you do a wish trading in one transaction without any upfront asset. Um, another impressive data we have is that um, in the year of 2020, over 100 million US dollars was lost in the DeFi attacks. And the flash loans are frequently uh, frequently appeared in these attacks. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that um, flash loans are the cause of these attacks, but it's now become a tool that facilitates DeFi attacks. Okay, so um, let's dive into this flash loan attacks as I just mentioned. So flash loans. Um, as I said, it's not only provide these ben benign use cases like arbitrages and liquidations, but, uh, but also open doors uh, for the DeFi attackers. 
in our paper, we detailed the very first two flagellum attacks that happened in the February of 2020. Um, both of the attacks are related to a DeFi platform called BZX, which is a lending and margin trading platform. Um, in today's talk, I will go into the details of the second attack, but I will first um, briefly describe the first one we call pump and upcharge. We can see from diagram that this is not a very um, kind of simple attack. Uh, we can see uh, several DeFi platforms we are involved. Uh, I won't go into the very details of this attack, but uh, the high level message I'd like to emphasize is that the attacker paid um, about 130 US dollars as transaction fee and realized a profit of 350,000 US dollars. And this is quite impressive. Uh, and even this is not the optimal case. Uh, in our paper, we present an optimization framework and the show that the profit can be boosted to 830,000 US dollars, which I will show later in my talk. So now I will go into the step-by-step um, -step details of the second attack, uh, which we call the Oracle manipulation. So here we have an adversary. Uh, in, in step one, the the attacker borrows 7,000 and, and the 500 Easter in a flash loan from BDX. So now the, the adversary has, um, as you can see in the red box, uh, the adversary has 7,000 and 500 Easter. In step two, the adversary exchanges uh, parts of the Easter, which is uh, 540 Easter for um, for 92,000 SUSD, which is another uh, st uh, stable coin, uh, Uniswap, uh, which is a, a Uniswap is a constant product AMM. So the exchange rate of this trade is about uh, 171 SUSD per ether. So from the state transition of Uniswap, you will find that in this relatively large trade, um, I mean, this is kind of a relatively large trade because um, before the trade, the Uniswap pool has less than 900 Ether, but the, the adversary inputs uh, five, more than 500 Ether in just a one swap. So the consequence of this swap is that the price of Ether now in this Uniswap pool now becomes uh, 106 SUSD per Ether. I will explain later why this price is very important. So in step three, the adversary trades 360 Ether for about uh, 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 63 SUSD in the Kyber Reserve. Kyber Reserve is another AMM, but not following the constant product rule. Um, I won't explain the details, uh, detailed formula of Kyber Reserve in, in this talk. Uh, what you need to understand is that, uh, again, this is a large trade for Kyber Reserve that changed the price a lot. You can check out the formula, uh, formula details in our paper. So the exchange rate of this trade is 176 SUSD per ether. So after the trade in step three, the ESA price in Kyber Reserve becomes 108 SUSD per ESA. Okay, um, now in step four, the adversary performs the third trade. This time the trade happens in synthetics, which allows to trade ESA to USDC at uh, uh, SUSD at a fixed price. Uh, here the exchange rate is 268 SUSD per ESA. Uh, so till now, the, the adversary performs three trades. All of the trades are selling ESA and buying SUSD, right? But apparently the price of the last trade is much better than the previous two trades in step two and three. Then what's the reason uh, that the adversary wants to perform the previous two trades? Um, the answer is ac actually in step five, where the adversary collateralized it's 1 million SUSD to borrow some ether from BZX. Note that um, 
this is an over collateralized borrowing, which means that uh, the value of the collateral should be greater than the value of the debt, which uh, sounds like the, um, the adversary cannot profit from the, the borrowing. But the key is that the BZX relies on Uniswap and Kyber as its price oracle. Recall that in step two and three, the adversary performs to relatively large trades in Uniswap and Kyber reserve. The price of the Ether in these two exchanges now are quite low. Uh, this means that BZX now believes that Ether is quite cheap. Hence, it can, it can lend much more Ether to the adversary than what it should be, even if it's uh, over collateralized lending. So after the borrowing, the adversary now have, uh, has um, nearly 10,000 Ether. So in steps six, after repaying the 7,500 Ether flash loan, the adversary has more than 2,000 Ether left as a profit. So this is basically how this attack tool works. Okay, so now let's jump to the optimization framework. The, the, the target of this framework is to obtain the optimal revenue of a specific attack vector and uh, also the corresponding optimal parameters are uh, used in this attack. Here, um, I mean, by attack vector, I mean, um, it defines how you perform an attack, like the sequence you perform the DeFi actions, for example, trading and borrowing in the BZX attack too. So we basically formulate all the DeFi actions into mathematical models. Uh, I put a very uh, example of a constant uh, product AMM. So given the current supplies of an AMM pool and uh, the input amount of the asset you want to trade in. Uh, following the formula, you can easily calculate the output asset you are expected to receive. With these formulas, we can um, construct an attack vector into a constrained optimization problem. And the objective function is the outcome profit of this attack. Uh, we, we, we fetched on-chain state uh, um, that the attack is expected to be executed on uh, normally um, it's the state of the previous block or if you do this in real time, it's the, it's the current block. Um, here I present the attack vector of the Oracle manipulation attack again, and, but I replace the concrete number with uh, the, the parametric symbols. The, the, the parameter of this attack is the, is the amount Ether traded in step two, three, and four, which are denoted by P, P1, P2, and P3. And the output SUSD can be expressed as three functions of P1, P2, P3 respectively according to the mathematical model we formulate. In this way, we can finally express the outcome profit as a function of P1, P2, P3 with some constraints like um, the sum of P1, P2, P3 cannot exceed the amount of the flash loan. Notice that um, for simplicity, I ignore the formula details and the sum of the constraints are missing here. So if you are interested, you can check out our paper uh, where uh, the details are listed. So we evaluate our framework on these two BZX attacks, and then we utilize the sequential, uh, the sequential list square programming library from SignPy to solve this optimization problem. Our machine has 16 CPU cores with, uh, with 32 gigabytes RAM. We, we also validated the optimization result by implementing the two attacks in Solidity, which is the language for the Ethereum smart contract, and executed them on the real blockchain state. Uh, the results show that the adversary didn't uh, perform the optimal attack and that the profit of the BZX attack one can be boosted from 300, uh, 350,000 US dollars to more than 800,000 um, US dollars as I just mentioned. And the second attack could have made more than 1 million US dollars. Uh, we also find our methodology is quite efficient. Uh, uh, both of the optimization took less than 15 milliseconds. 
Uh, that's it in my presentation. Um, uh, I really recommend to check out the details uh, in, in our paper. Uh, thank you for listening.